attention for a second. Uh, Nancy Ann DePearl is busy uh, on a call from uh, someone in the West Wing. Um, so we're going to be delayed about 10 minutes. Um, so if you want to get up and stretch, you want to talk to other colleagues. But uh, We only get five minutes for professors. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it'll be probably 10 more minutes. I think we're probably going to start at 1.15. I apologize. So. But, um, Oh, wonderful. I'm a fellow. No longer. 
indemnity on private insurers and uh, working on public goods where all the housing is really good, that, that the insurance companies were actually subsidizing the uncompensated. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. It hasn't been very good. It hasn't happened for about, what, 10 years? Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yes. How long have you been with them? I've done all that they can do. They call me to stay. Everyone seems to rave about all the other things. They're still, they're still, they're still stri struggling mightily. I mean, you have institutions trying to get bigger so that and incorporate smaller institutions by so that they can provide tertiary care to their right, right. No, it's everyone demographic and desirable patients. And well, so obviously you've been there. And then you have special one system doing that, and then another right, system right, right, right. That's, yeah, that's says, right. oh, wait, 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 you just came right. into my territory. That's great. And pediatrician? Okay. I'm going to come into your territory. Yeah. I'm going to buy a hospital that's near you. Yeah. They can serve as my place. Uh, yeah. In our area, that's, that is sort of settled out. We've got two big systems. One of this area, should be very interesting. What, what is happening? Kind of curious to see. Yeah. Kind of bring in primary, primary care people in particular and set them up in the office. Establishing office practices. So uh, it's hard to get up and turn it. For example, come in and join the entry. Right, right, right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's a lot less. That's going to happen. Passive administrative. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you lose, you lose some autonomy, but.
two minutes, so continue talking, but if we can start, sorry? Yeah, so we can get back to our seat. I can't imagine submitting a grant now without having a computer without a It's unbelievable. Just remember, if you're being constant, all of the whiteout we used to use. My wife, my wife is a teacher, and uh, in the early days of her teaching, she would mimeograph a lot. She'd come home with fluid fingers and just reeking at that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, we were with people. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? What kind of a physician do you internal medicine term? That's my problem. Yeah, I did hospitalist. I, oh, you did? I practiced for like three years. Yeah, 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 yeah. How are you? Good. Everybody's sitting pretty close together here, it looks like. We're all friends. So thanks everybody for coming. I'm Nancy Ann DeParle, the director of the White House Office of Health Reform. And hey, Shelley, it's good to see, good to see a good group of uh, physicians here with us today. I think this is our second uh, physician meeting on health reform, and we're really eager to hear from you how uh, how you're surviving these days in the real world practice of medicine and what we could do to make it better. And uh, we we are hopeful that. Uh, through the President's commitment to address health reform this year, that some of the things that we'll be able to do will improve the experience of practicing medicine and certainly improve the care that patients uh, receive, which is one of our top goals. As you know, quality is very uneven across our, our system right now. Uh, we have both many of the world's best hospitals uh, as well as too many that struggle to achieve basic core measure results. And sort of the the, the best and the worst at the same time. And choice is also threatened as physician practices are unable to accept new patients and as options for patients are narrowed by benefit design. So our goal uh, is to try to address all of these challenges and we're doing it by working with Congress and stakeholders across the system, including uh, you, including physicians. Um, as I said, we believe that reform offers a big opportunity to improve the experience of practicing medicine. We want to talk to you about uh, your thoughts about staying in medicine versus doing something else, which is something that as we look at physician, I see some smiles here. I know a few people in here who have thought about that, but um, we, we are uh, 
you know, want, want to make sure that there are adequate uh, clinicians around the country in all the places where they're needed. And one of the ways, as one of my colleagues here suggested to me, one of the ways to do that is to make sure that all of you uh, stay engaged in treating patients as long as possible. So that's something that um, I'm interested in hearing from you about. So we're really fortunate to have more than 30 physician leaders from around the country who have agreed to spend some time with us, um, including deans of medical schools, CEOs of teaching hospitals, leaders of specialty societies, um, chairs of academic departments, and several private practicing physicians. Um, and we really appreciate your willingness to come and share your perspective and expertise with us. Um, I'm very fortunate because I get to work with a number of uh, clinicians here at the White House on our health reform efforts. Uh, and I want to introduce them and have them tell you a little bit about themselves. And I'll start on my far left with Bob Kocher. Hi, my name is Bob Kocher. I work on the National Economic Council where I focus on healthcare economics and both the national health expenditure as well as the federal and state health expenditures. I'm an internal medicine doctor by background in my training at the facility clinic in Boston. And or with many of your hospitals, uh, for some time with McKinsey and Company, where I went health economics research there prior to joining the White House. I'm Dora Hughes. I'm an internist by background. I also have a master's in public health. I trained at Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston. Uh, following that, I've worked at the Commonwealth Fund uh, Foundation, focused on health policy issues. I worked then for Senator Kennedy, then for Senator Obama, and now happy to, to be working in the Obama administration. I'm Zeke Emanuel, uh, an oncologist and uh, bioethicist. And I'm working here on detail from the NIH uh, at OMB. Um, and uh, I guess I started out in Boston at the Beth Israel Deaconess and then did oncology training and stayed in Boston for a number of years before moving to the NIH, uh, where I ran the Department of uh, Bioethics. Kavita Patel, I uh, am an internist and a hospitalist by training and a health services researcher. Um, I was in practice for a while before I did the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program and then worked at RAND and UCLA in clinical work and health services on quality of care at RAND with Beth McGlynn and Bob Brook and then came to D.C. by, by a help from people like Dr. Hughes and worked for Ted Kennedy in his Senate Health Education Labor and Pensions Office and now I'm here working for Valerie Jarrett as the policy director for public engagement in intergovernmental affairs. Thanks. Zeke just suggested, and I would love to have everyone introduce themselves, so if we can go around quickly, starting with you, Jim. Sure. I'm Jim O'Connell. I'm a uh, practicing internist. I run the Healthcare for the Homeless program in Boston and work uh, sort of closely with Mass General and Brigham and Women's Hospital, as well as a lot of the health centers in town. And he survived a year of me as his medical student when he was a <laughs> resident. He does look kind of beaten down. <laughs> yeah. Right? Such a torture. And I'm uh, Christine Lane. I'm a general internist based in Philadelphia. I'm a faculty at Jefferson Medical College where I teach and still see, pa I still let me see patients occasionally. Um, but I spend most of my time at Annals of Internal Medicine uh, and the American College of Physicians. I'm Dr. Joel Bestman, and I direct Integrated Health Services at Holston Medical Group, and we uh, perform coordinated and integrated management of vascular risk factors uh, in that organization. My name is Christopher Chen. Um, I'm another Beth Israel uh, trained uh, resident. I did my residency there and then did my fellowship at Cornell, where I'm a cardiologist now. Currently down in South Florida, I help to run a multi-specialty group, and uh, happy to be here. David Kennedy, I'm a practicing otolaryngologist at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm uh, currently the president of the American Academy of Otolaryngology. Um, I'm Mark Richardson, one of three otolaryngologists in this <laughs> Whoa. Um, <laughs> I'm a practicing cardiologist at uh, Washington Hospital Center, a teaching affiliate at Georgetown, and a former White House fellow work for the Secretary of Veterans Affairs. My name is Stephen Lee. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician. I also did my residency at Beth Israel Business with Bob, actually. <coughs> and now I'm in San Diego, and I'm part of a, a, a large multi-specialty group of about 300 doctors, four pulmonologists, and I feel like a group that's really made a big effort to become a very organized, integrated uh, group over here. I'm David Schreiger. I'm a professor of emergency medicine at UCLA. Clive Callender, the Transplant Center Director at Howard University Hospital, Washington, D.C. 
I'm Linda Bosterman. I'm the managing partner of Wilshire Oncology, a six office site in Southern California, where we also take care of the two largest and poorest counties, San Bernardino and Riverside, and I practice oncology. I'm also the chief medical officer of a national group of private practices called Cancer Clinics of Excellence in 16 states with about 200 oncologists who've come together to practice on evidence-based guidelines and improve healthcare. I'm David Pariser, a practicing dermatologist from southeastern Virginia and a, and a 10 dermatologist uh, single specialty group. I'm also a very active uh, voluntary professor of the Department of Dermatology at Eastern Virginia Medical School. And, and in another life, I was president of a 2200 doctor IPA that, that provided uh, coordinated care down in southeastern Virginia. I'm Jim King. I'm the board chair for the American Academy of Family Physicians. I practice in a little town called Selmer, Tennessee, and over in West Tennessee. And a group practice of about eight family physicians, one general internist, God bless his soul, and a uh, group of nurse practitioners uh, trying to do the patient centered medical home in this present environment. I'm Mike Johns. I'm really happy to sit next to James King, who actually talks right. Uh. <laughs> I'm, I'm the, uh, I'm not at last, so I think I like that. Uh, I'm, I'm a chancellor now at Emory University. Prior to that, I was the uh, CEO of the health sciences there. Uh, prior to that, I was the dean of the medical school at Johns Hopkins. Uh, I'm Laura Amding. I did my medical training at the Mayo Clinic and Johns Hopkins uh, with a small detour to McKinsey where I did healthcare strategy uh, and finance work. Um, now, in a uh, somewhat unusual job, I'm in an experimental, freestanding, nonprofit breast center. I'm a salaried employee. Uh, all the doctors there are. Uh, and we're providing care for um, a wide range, um, trying uh, with grants and donations to be able to provide care for all the <coughs> patients. Where are you? Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, I'm Alan Randall from the University of Utah in Public City. Uh, I'm the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. I'm the head of the uh, Cataract and Glaucoma Service at the University of Utah. With a member of the international uh, team, uh, we have clinics in Ghana. We just built a hospital there. We have a clinic in um, Nepal and Kathmandu. And just returned from a millennium a visit to Ethiopia where we have. I'm Otis Brawley. I'm a medical oncologist and epidemiologist. I do a lot of outcomes work. I'm the chief medical officer of the American Cancer Society and a professor at Emory University where I work for my own time. I'm John Gage. I'm a practicing general surgeon at uh, Pensacola, Florida in a multi-specialty group. Um, I guess I'm old school and trying as and said to stay in practice uh, with the old school where we did trauma, uh, general surgery, vascular surgery, and still enjoy the practice of medicine. I'm Kathy DeAngelis, the uh, editor-in-chief of JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. I'm uh, trained in pediatrics, young adult medicine. Um, started life as a nurse. I also have an MPH, so maybe I'm the ultimate consumer. <laughs> uh, Kenneth Brown, I'm in the uh, clinical practice of uh, internal medicine and gastroenterology, providing care to the basic residents of the city of Washington, D.C. I did not train at Beth Israel, I'm sorry. I trained at Tufts, New England Medical Center. Uh, we also provide uh, educational experience for fellows at uh, a local Howard University uh, School of Medicine and uh, training in uh, gastroenterology, biliary tract disease, et cetera. I'm Cecil Welch, I'm a member of the AMA board, and, and in response to the introduction, my daytime job is as a solo uh, practice internist in Winter Park, Florida. Hi, my name is Scott Berkowitz. I did my internal medicine training at Hopkins, and I'm currently a cardiology fellow at Hopkins, and thank you very much for having me. My name is Manish Agarwal. I'm a practice oncologist here in Bethesda, Maryland. I trained at the NIH and was on faculty there before going into practice. Uh, we're a single specialty group, six physicians, trying to incorporate electronic medical records and dealing with some of the health healthcare challenges on a daily basis. I'm Roger Moore. I am a pediatrician and an anesthesiologist. Uh, I work at Deborah Hart Lung Center, which is a, a cherry hospital that does not charge patients anything. We're all salaried physicians. And I'm also president of the American Society of Anesthesiologists. That's me, Sharon Levine, also a pediatrician. And I also did my training in Tufts New England Medical Center. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a, pedi a pediatrician, as I said, and I work for 
the Permanente Medical Group, which is the <coughs> Permanente part of Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. Um, I'm working the leadership of the, the multi-specialty group practice of 6,600 <coughs> physicians, all of whom are salaried um, uh, integrated delivery system. Uh, I'm Shelley Zinberg. I was formerly uh, an internist and gastroenterologist, uh, chairman emeritus of Cameron Medical Group, a highly integrated, coordinated uh, system of healthcare delivery. Now, uh, uh, president of Nifty After 50, <laughs> which is uh, dedicated, dedicated to decreasing hospital and SNF day utilization uh, and from all causes. <laughs> I'm Herb Partis, I'm trained as a psychiatrist. Uh, I trained as downstate. Uh, I was down here for about six years running the National Institute of Mental Health and went back to the Phoenix Columbia and then kind of this uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital, which is the merger of Columbia Presbyterian and uh, New York Hospital. That uh, merger created a system which now does about one fifth of the care in the world uh, and um, has about 50 <laughs> Hi, my name is Gary Gottlieb. Uh, I'm a geriatric psychiatrist and I'm the president of Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston, which is part of the Partners Healthcare System, which you founded at the Massachusetts General Hospital, which is also the largest private employer in the state of Massachusetts. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm David Bjorkman. I'm dean of the University of Utah School of Medicine. I'm trained in uh, internal medicine and gastroenterology at the Brigham. And I also have degrees in public health and epidemiology. Um, as dean, I'm also the medical director of our medical group of 1,000 academic physicians working for university health care. I also direct the, uh, the Utah Medical Education Council, which has a CMS waiver to try to rationalize workforce needs with uh, uh, GME payments. I'm uh, Lewis Landsberg. I'm, uh an internist endocrinologist uh, uh, trained at, uh, at Yale. I was uh, formerly the chair of medicine and the dean at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, and I'm currently running a comprehensive center of obesity at uh, Northwestern. My name is uh, Russ Robertson. I'm a former elementary and junior high school teacher. <coughs> I went back to school and got a medical degree. I became a family physician, and I've been in academics uh, my entire life. Dr. Landberg hired me as the uh, chair of the now family uh, department of family and community medicine at, uh, at Feinberg, and I'm also the chair of the Council on Graduate Medical Education. My name is Dr. Alexander Peraza. I'm from uh, Redmond, California, San Bernardino County. Um, my only claim to fame here is I'm a faculty physician every day since 1981. Uh, trained at USC for my residency at San Bernardino County Medical Center. Uh, I signed my first managed care contract with commercial patients in 1984, continue to this day, and signed my first Medicare HMO uh, care paid for seniors in uh, early September 1986 and continue to this day. Good afternoon, I'm Rob Califf. I'm Vice Chancellor for Clinical Research at Duke University, practicing cardiologist by trade, and I guess you say I'm in the evidence generation business, which ranges from developing genomic biomarkers to the implementation of well, I can tell this is going to be a fascinating discussion. We want to just table set and uh, talk a little bit about how President Obama and how our administration views uh, the task we have ahead of us with health reform. So, Bob, can you drive this and I'll, I'll start and you can finish up. Um, so just to, just to set our table. Uh, you've heard this because the President, of course, campaigned around the country for two years talking about uh, the need to lower costs for all families and businesses and the need to, to uh, make sure that people have a choice of doctors, plans, and hospitals, and to assure affordable quality health care for all Americans. And those are the three things that 
the people sitting up here in front of you get up every morning thinking about how can we, how can we work with Congress to get this done and work with all of you to get this done. Um, we very much are starting from a position of building on the strength of our health system. We are not starting from a position of wanting to you know, get out a whiteboard and start from scratch. We think there are a lot of strengths about, about uh, our current health care system, including the fact, and some of you here are testimony to this, that we have unparalleled medical research and innovation, which we all want and desire as citizens and as consumers. We have access to leading technology, and we have the availability of specialized resources without prolonged waiting times, and those are all things that we think are strengths of our system. We want to preserve them and build upon them, and that's part of the way we're approaching uh, the idea of healthcare reform. At the same time, our level of health spending is extraordinary, and a number of you are here not just as practicing physicians or researchers, but also as employers. Herb, you are, um, Gary, a number of you are, and so you see this, Michael, you see this both as uh, people who are practicing the system, but also as those who have to purchase on behalf of your employees and figure out how to make, make this all work. And uh, we know that these costs are, are um, unsustainable for our businesses and for families. This is an illustration that is uh, kind of shocking when you think about it, that we spend uh, more on health care than we do on food now, more, of course, than China does on personal consumption at 2.2 um, uh, trillion uh, a year. So it's an extraordinary rate of spending. Um, and the rate of cost growth is consuming our budget. And if we continue at this rate, uh, it will be crowding out the spending that we agree that we need to do on uh, education, national security, and other things. So that is part of why you've heard the President talking about uh, bending the cost curve and doing some things differently that over time uh, will, will, will uh, lower the rate of growth so that it's more um, sustainable by our country. Bob? Oh, actually, I guess I have the last slide, which is the three <laughs> challenges we need to address together are one, cost, two, choice, and three, quality care. So those are the three things we'd like you to keep top of mind as we begin our discussion. And I'll, I'll take a moment and give you some context to each of these questions as an entry into the discussion that I think we're going to generate your I would just comment that that cost curve, if you look at it, the rate of growth, you just have five years, you Our hospitals, relative to other countries, are 
quite a bit more crowded. I would even say it's shorter. Our um, labor productivity is higher, but we have a tendency to do much more interventional and invasive types of treatments, which actually leads to higher costs. So these are four conditions that stand out when you look at the U.S. market in other countries. Uh, uh, bypass surgery, knee replacement, uh, PCI, and uh, diagnostic cardiac catheterization. These are four procedures where actually we do between 40 and 100 percent more than other countries on a risk-adjusted basis. And so we have an approach that's different than the rest of the world. If we were to simply be similar to other countries, that would be a $20 billion savings in our system. And arguably, if you agree some of the data that Bob and others have had, um, as good or better for patients. Don't blame them. <laughs> <laughs> so turning to oncology, which is a field that uh, Nick and I have been well in the room. You know, we have a tendency as well to choose the more sensitive approach when the data is either reportable or in some cases actually contradict. And so prostate cancer is disease that's common and widespread. I bet everybody in this room is in patients with prostate cancer. What's striking is how variable the treatment is, despite the fact that there's reasonably strong evidence for approaches to therapy. Um, androgen depri deprivation therapy is, you know, happens a third of the time. Interestingly, many times it's even, it's even prescribed by academic urologists when the data was actually argued for different treatments. When we think about radiation therapy, there's four choices, and the data would say that these are um, very similar. The prices are not. Um, there's a $70,000 difference between the choices that a doctor might make uh, for what the patient receives, and yet there's no survival difference. And so um, what's striking is we see growth rates on the most expensive ones, which are faster um, than on the others. And, you know, if you kind of think about that from a value conscious perspective, it causes one to step back and say, you know, what are the incentives that need to be behaviors? With that as kind of table setting, uh, I want to point out that the president has been very clear about the principles that were formal law. I think one of the striking and um, very uh, inspiring differences in terms of how reform is being approached this time is the fact that um, there's an ideology which is we need to have a system that's better value for our costs are control, where we reduce the variation in quality and hope to have a step change in, in quality and outcomes for patients in the experience of care, and where we preserve and develop on choice. The fact that all you are here and, and all you practice in different ways and care for patients is really a testament actually to the ingenuity and creativity of our system. That being said, while preserving those, we need to satisfy these guiding principles, which are really about making sure that for families and businesses and government, the cost is affordable and sustainable over time, that we can afford to provide the care. On choice that, that if you lose your job, you don't necessarily lose access to your health care. There's a way to maintain your continuity of care. If your income grows, for that matter, then you also lose your care and lose your, your, your doctor that, that might be caring for you in a, in a subsidized system. And that people can choose which doctors, hospitals, and people care for them and have, um, make, make decisions with their doctor. And on quality, I'd, I'd say there's only two problems to this. One is there's a lot we can do better about making us live better, take advantage of the um, behavioral economics literature about um, how to guide people towards better choices, how to create incentives for better choices, how to work with employers where people spend most of their time to make the work environment one that's more health promoting than not. Make sure that we disseminate better the literature on actually what works so that when people make investments in these areas that actually and then on the, on the clinical side, you all know the variation in care is, is dramatic. And doing things to reduce that and help make sure that, that it's easier for doctors and for patients to have the right thing happen is a major goal that we would have in this reform. Um, I would just point out that the president has demonstrated the seriousness in the stimulus bill. There were significant investments that have been long needed uh, in bolstering our health IT system, bolstering prevention and wellness, creating further effectiveness. Expanding the mission program. And in the budget, we intentionally have set the left and the right of being down a material amount of money to serve $30 billion as a down payment, but funded through both entitlement savings and new taxes in ways that um, will hopefully keep everybody at the table to see this through. Um, with that, I'm going to pause and simply say, you know, we really want to hear from you on what will make reform successful and really talk about each of these. So, how do we get, how do we bend that cost curve? How do we make quality something that we're proud of and that we're not worried about which hospital you're afraid to go to? How do we do this in ways that ensure that every American has access to the type of care that we all want everybody to have? So we're having to see if they kick us off.
So thank you. Um, this is, as uh, Nancy Ann mentioned, the second time we met with physicians as a group. And uh, what we're, the reason we're interested is uh, you guys are in the trenches, uh, and we uh, are in desperate need of ideas um, about how things work and what we can do uh, to actually address these big issues. So I would say that our challenge uh, and the questions we need answered are, um, what specific changes can we make that are going to help control costs and improve quality with the goal of using that uh, as the basis for covering all Americans uh, uh, in a sustainable way that we can go forward with without robbing uh, our children and our grandchildren uh, and making sure that everyone really can live uh, a, as healthy a life as possible. And with that, we're really going to open it up and hope to have a freewheeling discussion. Please no uh, set speeches and uh, position papers. We really want uh, uh, ideas and yeah. yes, yeah. <laughs> right. So. How do we incentivize docs to do that? Um, I, I think the fourth, the fourth uh, click in, in crossing the chasm was pay for performance. So you need to identify big primary care practices with electronic medical records, join them together, create a global vascular risk registry, and uh, give those doctors and practices feedback on how they're performing. And it's not about punishment, it's about bringing the best care to patients and uh, you know, paying the doctor for this valuable service. Okay. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with everything you said, and we've, we've demonstrated a 40% reduction in cardiac mortality over the last seven years. We've got a smoking rate of less than 9% now within our population, and an intervention rate that's, that's less than half of the median for the country by doing all of the things that you're talking about. I, I was struck, Nancy Ann, by, the, um, by your putting up there as building on the strengths of our health, current health system, the fact that we do many more MRIs than any other country except Japan, and at the same time, the, the, in the cost discussion, that our, our love of interventions um, and our incentive system that drives interventions. So we've got, I think, we, I think that is reflective of the national ambivalence about the tension between innovation for innovation's sake and the inability to distinguish new from improved and, and value from um, just doing more and doing less and so on. So from my perspective, how do we get docs to do what you've described and what we've been able to do is to change the incentives and um, I think it's more than about pay for performance. I think when you look at a 9% annual increase in doctor office visits, because that's the way doctors get paid, we know that a third of that care can be delivered in other ways other than driving to a doctor's office, parking, generating carbon, um, in, impacting the environment, and yet there's no way for physicians to be paid to do the right thing in a more efficient way. And I, I think 
unless we address uh, payment reform, we're not going to see the level of improvement that you're hoping to get out of this. Yeah, I would agree with Dr. Besterman, but I would expand it to preventive services for all diseases. And in that tone, I would resource a body like the Preventive Services Task Force so they can quickly uh, assess data and propagate what's good for prevention. Right now, it sometimes takes the Preventive Services Task Force five years to come up with a recommendation on something like prostate cancer screening. Also, I'd expand cognitive uh, reimbursement, reimbursement for cognitive services. Doctors do not get paid to talk to patients or counsel patients. Uh, part of the reason you have the knee replacement and all those other things that you listed is doctors get paid to do things to patients. Uh, just a comment about, I totally agree with, the, with what's been said in there in regards to getting this kind of data and putting people in groups together. Um, you, in order to do all this, we, docs can't practice in solo silos anymore. And I'm, uh, my specialty dermatology is one where almost 50% of the dermatologists in the United States are in solo practice. Um, it would be nice to find some way where docs could be aggregated in, 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 through med specialty societies, through state medical boards, medical society or something, where they could, in fact, uh, be able to take, uh, take advantage of some of these economies and some of these data, this data gathering ability that large, group, large groups have. And it's for us, it's a, it's a workforce issue, and I'm sure it is for many of you, so we'll be turn this here in the room, I mean, uh, to, to be expected to comply with this as a solo doc, it's going to be very, very difficult. So if there could be some way or some incentive for docs to aggregate in some fashion, I think that would, that would help. Dr. Wilson, you're a solo practitioner still? Thank you. I still am. And, and actually, that was a, a great segue to a different perspective. And I, and, and I do, do not want to give the set speech, but I think I would not be, uh, it would not be appropriate not to recognize what this administration has already done uh, in the stimulus package, putting a, a big down payment investment in comparative effectiveness research and uh, health information technology. Uh, and in the budget, looking for a pathway to resolve the Medicare uh, payment uh, issue. Those are good things, you said? Uh, they are good things, absolutely. Okay, and, and, sure. uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> this was in this was in the list of compliments. Uh -huh. uh, the, We're ready uh, for the second half. And, and we no, actually, there's not a, there's not a second half. And, and then the third is the recognition by the president that defensive medicine is a cost for this country, which is not sustainable. So let me just get to, uh, and, and I'm going to quote one of your papers, as a matter of fact, from JAMA. Uh, where you oh, observe, and, and you can, you can observe. Uh, Nancy Ann nightmares. What I wrote. Yeah, the you can observe if, if I get it right. Uh, but you pointed out, and this is sort of the face of medicine in this country, not the face of all medicine, but the face of medicine, which really is me. Uh, you pointed out one billion office visits in this country per year. Forty percent of them are delivered in solo practice offices. Another thirty-seven in, in offices of two to five. Position. So 77% of the outpatient, which you described in your slides, are in practices. So I, I think unless you, all the things that we're talking about which are good, and that's performance measures and comparative effectiveness of research uh, and evidence-based medicine are things that I, I think all of us feel in the long run are going to make a difference in quality of care and probably if the, if the cost doesn't come down, at least we'll be spending it more appropriately. So what, what do we need to do? $120 billion in defensive medicine each year, so tort reform so that when I look at a measure which says that not every eight-year-old who go, gets a bump on the head and goes to the emergency room needs a CAT scan, I don't have to worry about being sued because I follow that guideline. Absent that defense, that's the challenge. Or the other is, uh, the whole business of electronic health records, and that is to get information to me and my practice at the point of care when I'm seeing the patient. And a lot of that involves what was just alluded to, and that is how can physicians join together these, this group of physicians who are way out there, and that gets to initiatives related to antitrust. In other words, a method by which physicians and small practices can clinically integrate uh, to, to take advantage of quality improvement measures of electronic health records, and, 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 and that will require uh, the ability to negotiate uh, with the, the health plans to do that. And then uh, finally, and I think this really unfortunately does override all this, and that is that physicians for the last eight years have been living with an annual threat of significant pay cuts. 
no physician, and we're small businesses, no physician can make plans for the future, can make plans to expand what we're doing when we worry each year whether we're going to get a pay cut. Now, I think we're we, a little numb there, and we don't think that's going to happen, but even at that, it's not a, a coherent system. So I think those are measures that will make a difference in the world that, that I represent. Uh, you were. Yeah, I'll try, try to make a few points. I have a lot of great <coughs> points that made. I guess it's obvious that uh, for this to work, you've got to have multiple moving parts all at the same time. Because we've heard people describe doing more of things. So if you're going to do more on some things, you're going to have to do less of other things at the same time. The only self-serving, well, maybe the only self-serving comment I'll make is I think you've really got to rub up the evidence-generating machine because when you really, uh, we just published an article in JAMA that showed even in cardiology where we have more randomized trials than any other field, most right. of what we're recommending, we don't know if it's right or not. So um, on the surface, you'd say just figure out what's right and pay for what's right and then you've got it made because we stop doing all the things that don't work. But the fact is, we don't have enough research which is giving us that answer, so I hope you'll beat down the critics on comparative effectiveness. If you uh, learned what was right and then paid for it, the bugaboo to me that I can't figure out that I hope you'll figure out completely is uh, accountability. That is, uh, for paying customers who are intelligent, well-educated, and can use the system well, it's pretty easy to gravitate towards a reduction in unnecessary things inadequate reimbursement. Um, but measuring effective health care when you can't cherry pick your customers, which is what I think we need, is a very difficult and complicated thing to do. And if you don't figure it out, just because of the way Americans are, we'll figure out how to cherry pick. And I wish I had an answer to that. I, I agree with all the things that have been said. One of the things that concerns me, and I think we have to rethink our whole thought process on and therefore reimbursement. The reimbursement system as it exists today obviously is busted and it's not gonna work. SGR doesn't work. Uh, we keep hearing we're not we're gonna get a ten percent cut, but then we uh, we get a point one percent increase, but then the debt's still back there to be paid at some point when we don't know. So it prevents us. But I think we've got to get away totally from a system of being reimbursed for widgets. That's not going to work anymore. So how would you recommend, uh, what do you think about the bundle payment idea then? Well, it, it bothers me in some respects because who's going to have control of the bundle? And, uh, you know, he asked that question a, a lot too. In the <laughs> uh, and the last thing they want to hear is, well, the insurance industry has control of the bundle or the hospital has control of the bundle. And they, here we are sitting out here as some of us have done in the past, please help me. Uh, that, I don't think it's gonna work, but we've gotta get away from this. If I do more widgets, then I get paid more money because you perpetuate the improprieties of what you don't even realize you're doing, baby. Uh, I see friends of mine that operate on 85-year-olds that have inguinal hernias, and the only reason they knew it is they went to their primary care physician and found out they had one. Doesn't change their lifestyle, may alter their lifestyle permanently if they get it fixed, because they may die. Uh, wrong process. Doesn't bother you, don't worry about it. These are the risks you have, and you know them, don't fix it. Let's save money. But unless we get away from, I did more today, or I saw more today, uh, we're not gonna get a different thought process of how we get reimbursed. There is value in quality, and maybe more value and quality than there is in the number of widgets we produced last year. Dr. King. Uh, you know, and that lays kind of what I, you're going to have to really focus on, pri on preventive services, primary care, and our, you know, the concept we have at the patient center medical. And you've asked the question, how, how, what are we going to do in the way of paying? You're going to have to pay us different in, in primary care. You're, I mean, it's the same thing. I, I'm, you have to count how many patients I see every day to generate how much I'm money. How much money I make is if I can't get them sitting on the table, I don't get any money out of it. And 40% of what we do in our office is each day we're not paid for. It. It's just that simple. As I try to help my patients navigate through this health, complicated healthcare system, most of the work I, we do in our offices are not covered. I have a lady that's just in charge of making sure my referrals are done properly so the hospital gets paid if I order an MRI, my subspecialist colleagues are paid for if I get them to the right person. While we do this, we don't mind taking that responsibility, but you have to flip the way you pay us. 
I don't see the fee for service going completely away, but the management fee that's coming forth and we're paying us to manage our patients, take care of our patients, have them go through this system is important. And then we're not scared to pay for performance, or what I'd rather call pay for quality, because the animals that they perform, you know, but, you know, and we have me providing quality. But it's going to take all that kind of tied together, because any one of you just you just pay me fee for service, you're paying me to do as much to as many as I can. Do you yeah. have, I'm oh, sorry, do oh, you I'm have sorry. In, um, information technology, clinical information systems in your yes, office? Yes, I have, I have electronic health records. We have three practice sites that are all tied together so that we're seeing our patients tied. But when we have a great system, three, three, three in three Selma? practice sites. Well, we have one in Selma, one in Henderson, and since you know Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> one, in, one in Selma, one in Henderson, one in Adamsville. All right. We're about 15 miles apart. It's one of the small communities there. Each one of us about 5,000. And uh, that we're tied together to take care of working out of one hospital that we use for our care. And we can't tie to our hospital because of all the things. So if our system's different and all the things, can't tie to my subspecialist colleagues in Jackson 45 miles down the road because of the same problem. To get information. Wait, wait, is that interoperability or is that's that interoperability. or is that uh, antitrust or? It's, it's whatever the vendors use as an excuse not to do it or want to charge me $50,000 to do it. They have a different vendor. <laughs> they have a different vendor than you do. They have different vendors and then the connectivity to get, get those things done. But you're going to have, because there's too many of us, there's too few primary care physicians. Our general internist colleagues are decreasing, pediatricians, and people are choosing. And it doesn't matter what you do with everything else. You don't have that space to take care of those patients. And as a portal to get them into the system to get all these things that have been mentioned that are good, it just won't happen. Well, you know, I have the least experience of anyone in the room, but what I do have is my, uh, my kind of micro uh, example down in South Florida. When you're talking about incentives for the physician, we actually have an at risk practice of primary uh, care uh, physicians. And, and essentially, what we're doing is we're trying to reduce catastrophic events. Um, because it's how we're being paid as a group. Everybody in the group actually participates. Um, we've actually uh, pushed forward through with an EMR system that we developed our own. Um, we've come up with the first ever uh, manless digital pharmacy. Um, and because we're also being paid for outcomes, for reducing catastrophic events, we actually go and pick our patients up and bring them to us if they don't show up. Because we are accountable for their outcomes. We're accountable for them doing well. And that's actually how we are reimbursed. So every single physician in the practice, their goals, are saying, how can I reduce the catastrophic events? And what we found is, is it took us a while to convince the insurance companies to allow us to do this. Why? Because we spend 20% more medications than everybody else in South Florida. Because we spend more referrals. Because our physician-patient ratios are smaller than everybody else's. I know they are in California. Ours are quite, they're a lot smaller. Quote numbers, but, but they're a lot smaller. And, the, and, and we actually, we, we grill, um, they, you know, Dr. Kato, thank you so much because all that data that you're generating, we, we actually use that and we use the outcomes of that in our practice. And we look at that and we say, look, what are the things that we're going to be able to do that are going to reduce bad outcomes, really bad things? Now, we can't reduce them all, but we can reduce some of them. And we can adhere to those principles and those guidelines. And as a group, everybody agrees. And so physicians aren't upset that they're, you know, uh, oh, they're cutting down on my procedures or doing this. Everybody's working on the same goals. It's a team effort. And at the end of the day, you know, the, the cost of the care, over, the overall cost of the care that we were able to prove is significantly less because it's those big catastrophic events that are draining everybody. It's that, it's that two week stay in the ICU intubated on pressors or it's, the, it's that those horrible complications. Your 92 year old patient who goes in for a hernia surgery uh, gets a little bit of sedation and next thing you know, she, he, she's out and now she's in the ICU for two weeks and the pay, pay, family has to decide what they do now. Those are the cases that you have to really try to focus on, and, and, and that's how you align the incentives, that you actually make the physicians accountable to outcomes. What's the digital pharmacy? Oh, the digital pharmacy. Well, so this is just an example of um, what we've been able to uh, Because we're all working as a team, and we found that there was a need, we said, you know what? We spent a lot of time dealing with pharmacists going back and forth. We try to give the patients three months supply, but the pharmacies don't want to give it because they get more revenue from monthly supply, plus, our patients with compliance is a big issue. All those things were major, major issues. We want our patients to take medications, unlike some other practices. You know, we actually we hand it to them. And the way we do that is we work with a company to help develop the first in-office, in-practice, full-functioning pharmacy. You're basically cutting out the pharmacist. But here's the benefit. I have an electronic medical record system. So I have a six year. We didn't buy any pharmacists. Here's the benefit. Before uh, we 
we implemented the system, we studied this, less than 50% of the time what's in my electronic medical record and what the patients are actually taking are two completely different things. And that's a scary thing because I'm a, I'm a, medical, I'm a medical doctor, okay? So my tools and my armamentarium is medicines. And less than 50% of the time they're, 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 they're not giving the same medications I take. Uh, Caleb will tell you, when they leave, when they, patients go home after an MI, the average number of medications that they go home on is anywhere from 8 to 11 medications. These are old 70-year-old patients with possibly lower perfusion in the brain. They're not going to be able to, you know, uh, you know, uh, know what medications stop and start after, after if they do decide to go to the pharmacy. So we just we came up with a system that when you put the medications into the electronic medical record, the, the it goes to some fancy machine that we have to develop. It's 18 months. The reason why we developed this was because our, our doctors asked for it. They asked for it to improve outcomes. The, the, this, this huge room is just full of a company, you know, does robotic and all this other thing. Grabs a medication, sealed from the, from the manufacturer, never touched by human hands, labels it, boom, goes right to the patient. So that way, when the doctor walks out of the room and cracks his door, he says, instead of saying, oh, here's some samples that the local drug uh, reps gave me, um, which we don't, we don't wear, we have sample free, actually. We, uh, we say, here, here's 90 day supply uh, or 30 day supply of whatever medication, especially for my sick heart failure patients, they're so tender and those emissions they cost a lot of money and a lot of them. So I can sit there and say, I want you to take this, put this in your mouth. And when you come back next time, you bring those same drugs to me. This is an effort to improve compliance. What we've noticed now, concordance, and, and we're gonna go ahead and publish this, but concordance between what I think the doctors are, the, the patients are taking and what the patients are actually taking, greater than 90% now. The patients are overwhelmingly happy Okay. We're going to eventually start tracking outcomes and, and reduction of uh, CHF emissions because now actually my patients are taking their medications and a significant reduction of cost. We're talking about 20, 10 to 20% reduction of all medication costs. That's huge. So, but this is a system that was born in an environment where I have 20 some doctors sitting together and saying, how can we improve our outcomes and reduce costs? And this is an example of that. Ooh. <clears throat> so l let me uh, emphasize something that's been alluded to, and that is the need to save primary care. I mean, medical students uh, now are not mm -hmm. opting into uh, primary care. They're going into uh, specialties, and uh, it's easily understandable. They graduate medical school with a debt of over $150,000. They have their training after college is anywhere from seven to 14 years, at which point they make maybe you know, 50000 a year uh, on the average. Uh, so they are opting for lucrative, procedure-based, widget-making uh, uh, specialties. So we have to do something because increasing the access, and with the baby boomers coming along, there is going to be a <coughs> need for primary care physicians. And there are several different ways, I think, that that could be approached. Because I've been very impressed by the speed with which the economic realities are translated into career choices that physicians make. So if a program of uh, loan forgiveness, uh, I think would be an important first step in encouraging people to go into primary care. And I think uh, the other is the maldistribution of uh, physicians, getting them in the right place. So I think financial incentives to get physicians to practice in underserved areas is critically important, and I think the evidence suggests that many people who go to underserved areas because of a financial uh, stimulus, if you will, tend to stay there. <coughs> and, uh, t uh, they become uh, an important part of the community. So I think that's, th this I think is critically important. And just let me make one other point about generating evidence. I, I think uh, that the practice-based research network is something that is, is a step beyond clinical trials. Clinical trials have done a tremendous amount. They're very useful. It's an artificial situation. I think with the electronic health record and with the kind of databases uh, that we've heard about, it, it's possible to actually develop practice-based research networks that will answer some of these important questions uh, in, in a, in a a real rather than an artificial situation. Oh, you know, uh, Zeke, uh, I, I want to comment at first for bringing people in and, using, and getting all the constituents in because I think with this big problem to attack, the way to do it is to have a multiple solutions. And if you can uh, allocate to each area some way by which we get better, that's terrific. So I think what the administration is pushing right now is already in that direction. If you cover the uninsured, my impression is that's going to cut our emergency room activity 
and also will cut down on some of the unnecessary hospitalizations. There's, there's cost in that. The second thing is, and you've heard it before, uh, I think you've got to make it easier for us to work with each other, and that means a relook at the uh, stock provisions. Uh, and third, uh, this defensive medicine and malpractice is something that uh, affects us all, and that may be a tough one to take on, but I think what's been impressive is the administration's willing to take on all kinds of things, so that, uh, that belongs in that pot, along with also trying to do something about streamlining billing and uh, collections, uh, because you've got doctors and hospitals who have compliance officers. We, we hire more compliance officers than clinicians, and they're, they're hiring denial officers. I have a question. If we streamlined it, what would you save? What would I say? Yeah. I would, I, 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 it's not rough. Uh, rough. We're not asking for the cents. Three, four, five percent, which is non-trivial for us. I, I don't know what these <laughs> But in that range. Yeah. It might, might be a little higher. All I know is we spend a tremendous, you take that and malpractice insurance out. Or you can give us some kind of national uh, fix on malpractice. Then we can cut the rest of your budget. Pardon me? Then we can cut the rest of your budget. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say anything. How many hundred people would be around the Oh, several, several. No, more than a thousand. Yeah, 1,400 at Duke? Did nothing but process and bills and deal with How many at Brigham? Partners probably close to a couple of thousand, 1,500. Whoa. How many do you have? I don't know the exact number. I'd have to, I, I, I would make approximation. Hundreds of estimates. The, the, the cost per position, Published in uh, healthcare, we're yeah, right. About six hundred thousand dollars just doing billing. Three hours a week, all docs is doing billing conversations. Total waste of a great resource. Who could actually help any human being? We're on to this. Uh, emergency rooms. I just want to ask uh, Dr. Schreiger, you're an emergency room doc. If we cover everyone, are we going to make your life easier or harder? I'm neither. I, mean, I really don't think that's what the issue is, and I'm a little bit surprised. Um, <laughs> That no one is, I'm not surprised in the sense that the group of physicians assembled here have all talked about tweaks that involve physicians. And as I sit here, I, I think of the following things. If the first principle is that we have to live within our means, taking into account the fact that some have more means than others and we need to account to try to set a baseline for the typical person in America, that that's step one, that that has to come for all these excellent ideas of how to tweak. If we're going to live within our means, you have to set a level of health care which we can afford. And no one's really talking about that. And I think uh, unless you talk about that, the juggernaut of health care, look, health is the easiest thing to sell. Everyone wants to live well and live long. And even if you do risk reduction and keep people alive to 90, they're still going to have other crises at 90. And it's still going to, I mean, you're going to keep paying as long as you say the pot of gold is there and we're going to keep dipping into it for more health care. It, it just perpetuates itself. So unless you accept the fact that we have to set a budget and live it, with it, and the notion that we have to decide, is it better to put more dollars to benefit social welfare? Should we be putting the money into education or into health care? Should we be putting it into public health mo measures, advertising, walk to work, bicycle to work? Are we going to get more dollars for our buck putting up billboards and having companies have incentives for people who ride to work or walk to work than we are about having a 1,000 extra office visits among people? That's the level that this has to be solved. After you get through what can we afford, and what is the best amount of resources to put into healthcare? Then you do all these things to optimize it. And I don't disagree with anything that's been said, but I think we're really missing the boat if we just talk. If we don't live with the reality that healthcare will consume every single dollar we have unless we say no. That's not acceptable. Uh, one thing that concerns me is that throughout the entire discussion, we haven't talked very much about education. Dr. Landsberg brought it up. Student debt is a huge issue. But a bigger issue is that our method of funding medical education, both undergraduate and graduate medical education, is fatally flawed. Um, with the Balanced Budget Act of uh, <clears throat> 1996, 97, it capped the number of residency positions. Um, in a state like Utah, where we already have a dramatic phys physician shortage, <clears throat> it has really impacted our ability to serve our, our populace. Um, I think that needs to be addressed, and I believe there's a bill in Congress right now to, to address that. I'm even more concerned, uh, and I think that the IME, GME issues with Medicare are, they don't make any sense to me, but, but you need to replace it with something. You have to have some way of funding graduate medical education. And I would go further and say that you actually have to address academic medical centers and how they will fund undergraduate medical education. The issue that Dr. Landsberg brings out, the issue of primary care, the issue of debt, has a lot to do with how 
undergraduate medical education is funded. And right now, our students fund their own education. And our students uh, have about $135,000 in debt when they graduate, which affects their career choices. We have to figure out some way that we're going to, we're going to support undergraduate medical education other than expecting the students to pay for it or expecting the specialists who are uh, having more, who are ordering more widgets or doing more widgets to then cross-subsidize the educational mission. Uh, how would you change GME? I, I would I would get an entirely new system. I think that the based federal, on I, I think it needs to be based upon what workforce needs are, and I think that you need yeah. to look at regions of the country. I don't think you should have a national workforce office because I think then you miss what regional needs are, because medical medical schools are distributed mainly on in the east, and that's just for historic purposes, and therefore GME programs are distributed mainly in the east. The best predictor of where a a physician will practice is where they finish their residency training. So I think what you need to do is you need to look at workforce needs and develop a system to fund graduate medical education and undergraduate medical education in a way that makes sense. If we're going to realign incentives and we're going to decrease payment for specialists to, to perform more procedures, to, 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 to order more tests, that's money that right now we use to cross-subsidize our education mission. As Dr. Crandall will tell you, he takes home less money because we take his money to perform our education. And this year, we had to cut our medical school class by 20% because of loss of funding. And that's, that's perverse. Um, <clears throat> one issue that hasn't come up is uh, end of life sort of issues. And uh, being an oncologist, I see a lot of um, waste at the end of life. And you know, this morning, since I'm in Bethesda, I saw patients before I came in, I saw a 51-year-old gentleman, he's got refractory colon cancer. His daughter's graduating on Tuesday, but he's sort of at end of life, and it's a 15-minute visit, you know. And that's not a rush conversation to sit down for 45 minutes and to say, well, I've got a meeting at the White House, but I'm going to be late. And, but to talk about hospice, to talk about, and, you know, and then, so then I have to go back and I have to dictate and I have to think about, do I do 10 review systems or 12? And, and then the billing person that works just to support me is also has to figure out whether we're going to get paid for that, and the system is not at all structured to encourage that kind of conversation. And there's so much waste of resources at the end of life that do not improve quality of life or or increase length of life. Um, I think that we all see in the hospital and outside of it. And primarily, I think it's time and relationship driven. I mean, I've seen this patient for two years. I could tell them and say, "Look, we fought hard for this long. It's time to stop." And it was an easy transition into hospice. But if you don't have those relationships, and the system right now is not set up to cultivate those relationships, you don't, it would be much easier and I'd get better reimbursed if I gave him treatment. But to do what I did was actually financially, and so I think that system has to change. Well, uh, I haven't heard a bad idea for uh, a comment. I don't mean funding health club memberships or, or uh, group exercise programs. But if you could reduce one hospital, one sniff day a year, you would save, with today's Medicare population of 40 million, you would save $100 billion. And as the Medicare population grows from 100 million to four, from 40 million to 80 million, you're talking about 200 billion dollars a day. And in response to your comment, you're absolutely right. People are going to keep getting older if we make them healthier, and they're eventually going to face catastrophe. Christian Bernard said, "The goal should be to die as young as you can, or as late as you can." In other words, let's stay healthy and drop dead. That's exactly what prescription fitness can do. I'm talking about a complete fitness evaluation, customized program that identifies general levels of fitness and specific areas of deep fitness. Because as we age, and I know I'm 76 years old, as we age, 
are specific areas of deconditioning are worse one from the other. They're different one from the other. And if we can address them, and we can with prescription fitness, we can save. We can cut 1.04 hospital days per year in the Medicare population at $2,300 a day minimum. That's a huge decrease in Medicare spending. We can save, we can save 1.4, almost one and a half sniff days per year in the Medicare population. We are talking about saving more than $100 billion, more than $100 billion today with today's program and also employing thousands of people in a new variety of fitness, medically prescribed fitness in the senior population. I think this is a segue. Bob and I were laughing a little bit to say that we had a list of topics that we wanted to cover, and as we surmised in the beginning, all of them have come up, and I, I, you know, I think uh, this has been a very helpful conversation. In our remaining few minutes, we would like to really challenge all of you to drill down and say, well, we've covered all these issues and challenges. What, how exactly, what is the role of the federal government in, this, in a health reform package? What explicitly will you be looking for in terms of what will uh, help to reduce costs, improve quality, address population health? I mean, think of all these areas. What exactly uh, do we need to be doing considering the mixture we have on the table? And well, so with all Dr. of that. Dr. News, I, I, would, I would suggest that we qualify uh, programs to provide prescription fitness as any Medicare benefit, but they should qualify. Kinesiologists, physical therapists, people with uh, degrees in physical education, uh, and certify them to be providers <coughs> in the country. This is the low hanging fruit. This is the DNA of healthcare management. This is the DNA of disease. I, I think there are multiple things, and you've heard some of them already. You streamline the billing collection, get a malpractice fix, modify the stock laws. There's a, there's a whole flock of things that we put on the table. There's another element, though, that I think we need to think about, and that's public education. One of the things that perhaps the government can do, I don't know if it was Surgeon General or what have you, is get the public to actually truly understand the health care problem. You know, uh, last time I looked, our per capita health expenditures were the greatest in the world, 1.7 times the number two country, which was, uh, I think, Switzerland. And it's because there is medical gluttony in the United States. We can, we have, it's, it's quite interesting. We have all of these health disparities, but we have a part of the population that consumes too much health care, and a part of the population that doesn't consume enough health care. And I'm hoping that through some public education about public, about personal responsibility, uh, we might actually get people to use, and you guys can use this phrase, we're not for health care rationing, we're for the rational use of health care. Okay. And uh, I'm, you know, that's I only rational use of health care is only about talking about through public education beyond just physician education or pandering, not pandering the wrong word, or trying to satisfy physician yeah, this, one, this comment on the um, on this global prevention where I think it's really important and what needs to be is driving this help all kinds of health care, you know. So, we mentioned earlier a few of us actually look at it from two sides. I was a large employer. I think you need to keep an eye on this from a federal perspective. Now, there are incentives now for federal, for a large employers, for all employers, in fact, to put in place wellness prevention programs. There's some marvelous examples out there, and I know you've heard about them, uh, and large companies who can show you statistics and data of how, in fact, the programs have actually lowered these costs. So I think, you know, that's one of my concerns. We blow away employer health as an approach. Uh, what happens is nobody's interested in the health of their employees. There is a four to one, they don't only retrieve the health uh, uh, savings, they also re uh, retrieve productivity savings, which the economists can give you a number. I heard it's four, to, four for every dollar that's, that's spent. So I, you need to keep your eye on that ball. We have to look at how, how can we invest in that? Is there a way to put some uh, uh, incentive into employers to actually put in place these programs. So when I try to push it out of university, you know, it's amazing how much resistance you get. Plus, there are certain laws that prevent us from getting access to the kind of data we really want to help people. 
So we, we need to think that through. GME, one last thing I need. I suggest you consider going back to something that was on the table about 15 years ago called an all payer program. We've got to lift the, the if you want to fix the, the uh, workforce, you're going to have to produce more doctors. You mean, it, others would contribute to yeah, graduate medical education. Yeah, go back to and, and just to be clear, you said something about if we don't have an employer, I mean, the, the president's plan builds on the employer based system. So uh, just to be I, clear about that. About there are. But that's, sure that's not us. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I just want to, one of the specialists here, I just want to remember there's still going to be access to us on specialists. Uh, if everyone in this room does what they, what they claim, which I hope they do, 100% of them are going to get cataracts, 4% of them are going to get glaucoma. <laughs> so we, we still need to consider uh, maintaining a very good, high quality subspecialty. Yeah. Uh, and I just want to say a couple tactical things that could potentially be done at a federal level that would be helpful. One addresses this issue of different health systems not speaking to one another. There are these standards, but they're not mandatory and they're not implemented well. Something called IHE, which is this committee. Um, that implements these DICOM standards, these HL7 standards. You know, I'm coming at this from an imaging perspective, and one thing that's very important for us is that these systems all be integrated so that we can have additional order entry, not just at big academic centers, but for private practice positions. Many of them have no idea whether the test they're ordering is actually going to be helpful or not, and we can't provide them that. These things should be able to be plug and play the way that your library can talk to your computer, but the way that these companies get paid, they make actually the most money on these integrations. So one thing that could be done would be to federally regulate people have to follow these standards like IHE, make this data transferable between different systems in a way that is plug and play, that would allow different physicians' offices with different products to be able to transfer data in a way that's needed. Um, another thing that I would just say very briefly would be to make sure that any changes that are made are tied to quality. Um, you know, it doesn't make any sense at all that an MRI that's done very well, that's Dutch read by a fellowship trained radiologist and, and read in a timely manner is reimbursed the same or perhaps poorly, more poorly than one that's done on a poor piece of equipment and poorly interpreted over days later. So that doesn't make any sense. Deficit reduction up to cut across the board didn't reward people who were doing quality imaging. There are standards out there. Uh, the American College of Radiology has started with the appropriateness criteria in terms of what should be used when, and also accreditation of imaging. It's a good base that needs to be built on. Scott, agree. Just a few things as a, as a trainee. Uh, first of all, with respect to picking up on the integration uh, piece, even within our hospital, we have at least three different information systems. We have paper charts and other parts. If you compare that with neighboring institutions, we don't have access to any of their data. We don't have access to their same studies. We're not able to get them in a timely manner. So a lot of this information is then repeated uh, and, and, and without having the means to actually access that even within our own institution. Secondarily, with, with respect to with the primary care issue. Um, I think one of the other things that was discussed and has been uh, studied at Kaiser as well has been the issue of the amount of al alternative ways to have visits and, and looking at ways of phone calls and other me methods. And what I've appreciated is that some of the physicians who are the most beloved by their, uh, by their patients are the people that actually spend, for every hour you see patients in clinic, they're spending almost an equivalent amount of time following up on studies, getting back to them about results. That type of human interaction, when you have a 20-minute return visit, you need that extra time to be able to speak to people, and the system isn't necessarily in place to be able to allow them to get that type of interaction even afterwards. Those people are not compensated for all that additional work that is essential to their care. So, so there, there have been a number of very successful and interesting demonstration projects that have come from CMS, high user Medicare populations, dual eligible populations, in which there's been flexibility of payment. Um, I, I think that that addresses issues of end of life care, of uh, using preventive medicine, and of starting to reduce some of the perverse incentives. The brilliance, though, of the $630 billion is that it theoretically buys you an opportunity <coughs> for some patients because as you unravel pieces of the system, there will be unintended consequences. And to have a knee-jerk purely focused <coughs> on cost without understanding the beauty of 
pieces like that, that exist in those demonstrations could be costly as it was to behavioral health care, where essentially we subcapitated, moved from 8 percent of premium on the commercial side to less than 2 percent of premium, and we've lost generations of people providing care to people with depression, schizophrenia, and other disorders which haven't gone away. And so the thoughtfulness and patience that, that's going to be necessary to be able to use the data that you have, because there's a latency to, com to comparative effectiveness research. There's a latency to the workforce plan that's necessary to build the portals on both ends to be able to manage chronic disease and to create prevention. But let me push you for a second. We're very interested in the dual eligibles. Uh, do you have a specific demonstration you thought was successful by your Well, the life? senior care options uh, dual eligible populations that have been very, very interesting that have essentially allowed uh, groups of providers to work together uh, and essentially to enable access uh, uh, to uh, a variety of non-health care uh, components. I mean, one of the, the issues of, of payment reform is that it can't rip away the notion that there's a lot of the social fabric of health care that exists within academic medical centers and elsewhere that are paid for through cross-subsidization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just real quickly, uh, uh, 2008 AAMC questionnaires, 14.2 percent of uh, U.S. allopathic <coughs> medical students said they wanted to go into primary care. If you subtract out the 5 percent and want to be pediatricians, that's 9 percent. So if you want an idea of what the pipeline for primary care physicians looks like, that's a Exactly. I didn't subtract Thank them. You. I just said in terms of looking at adults, but, care but, for adults, I, I respect the pediatricians in the room. Uh, but, but Dr. Hughes, you asked for specific points. A specific point is you have to address the pipeline. Because if you're going to increase the number of people in the system, you need to increase the number of providers. We know that future providers are working fewer hours than the providers now. So, I'm sorry. And, so anyway, but thank you for that. And uh, yeah, I just, I'm, part of what I'm concerned about is care for adults with chronic disease. And I think that's an area where we've got significant uh, issues. And the reality is a lot of physicians do not want to care for these people because they're complex. They take a long time. The return on the, the feeling of caring for them is sometimes compromised. So I just wanted to get that out there so that you're aware of that. Uh, the other problem with regard to GME is that hospitals drive GME. Mm -hmm. uh, if hospitals want more GME positions, they generally can find a way to fund them, uh, but they're generally not in primary care areas. Right. Uh, there have been 37 family medicine residency programs that have closed over the last four or five years. They're very expensive programs to run. The way GME is structured, it does not focus on, it doesn't provide reimbursement for uh, people who are learning in those settings. A couple of quick thoughts. Uh, Cogni has recommended an all-payer approach on a number of, uh, of occasions, so I'm happy to, happy to hear that. But another thought that's out there is a base closing commission to deal with GME, something along those lines uh, to bring in people together to make a corporate solution uh, that really has a tendency, I think, to mitigate some of the capacities of other organizations to influence the process. I spent 45 yeah. minutes on the phone yesterday with a company yeah, trying to get a stress test approved. And I asked them to be wrong. And I said, well, you know, there's risk. And the risk is moves. Um, and right now, I'm risking you to someone who's ordering a test. I mean, you're ordering a costly test. And he said, but doesn't board certification decrease that risk? And I said, I thought about that. And I realized that board certification certifies my training. But it says nothing about my practice. It doesn't say anything if I'm reading Dr. Caleb's articles. And so I thought, are there some creative ways for me to mitigate risk for other people? And is there some way that I, like a bond, could be double A rated? You know, for someone I don't have to spend 30 minutes on the phone because I have proven that I am that caliber of provider. And I think that it's only when you create that level of transparency that then you can talk about competitive issues, you can talk about market forces. Because if a patient, what would they, I mean, if I'm incredibly charming, and they like the whole type, they may come to see me regardless of whether I keep with the guy. So I think that that's a big part. To GME, I would say, we're sitting on a very big problem. Because as work hours have gone down, the, the current new doctor's idea of what a work week looks like is extremely Different. So the reason that I like my job now is because I work less than I did when I was a cardiology fellow at Brigham. Uh, but I can tell you that these new guys that are going to come out are going to probably work more as an attending staff physician than they did as a trainee. And that's going to create a lot of tension. And people are no more and more thinking about their own personal lives. The idea of the doctor rolling up to your house with those doctors, that is a gone issue. So it has to be addressed wholeheartedly. Extenders too. Someone that came from a different system, from the UK system, 
and just look at, come back to that question of what the government can do here in terms of controlling costs. And I see a few differences that I think are important. One is obviously the amount of money that goes into end of life care um, and developing some sort of consensus um, about what you refer to as, 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 as health care green. I think that's, that's important. Um, uh, and what really is a health care right? The UK has done that better. Um, they have a better understanding of what really is a health care right. We can provide so much in medicine now that the costs are uh, potentially almost unlimited. And we do have to have some idea of what is a health care right. A couple of other issues. One is, of course, the, the debt when they leave medical school, which essentially is not a system. So um, that's not a big issue for the last step of life. And the other issue is that when it comes to end of life care over there, if you say, I am not going to do another bone marrow transplant on your terminally ill mother, you are indemnified because there's crown indemnity for all physicians acting within the state. So that's a huge issue. So you are supported in your decisions. And, uh, and so the defensive, uh, the defensive aspects of healthcare are just not there. So those are some of the things that could be done. Uh, Clive, we're going to have a few more comments, and then we're going to do a couple of polling questions. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to expand upon the comment made about chronic health, because I think that uh, the place where chronic health can be managed best, perhaps, is in the community. And looking at uh, that model and trying to identify, expand upon that could be m more cost effective uh, than we've talked about so far. Mm -hmm. In oncology, where with 85% of oncology is given the community of an aging population, if we could come up with a federal pilot so that networks who have come together, who are getting electronic medical records all networked, who can prompt at the time of decision making and give you data on evidence based guidelines, if our patients can get data back or get a benefit on their co pays, Right now, they're forced in California to join HMOs, and we're forced to prescribe expensive chemotherapy drugs that have drug co-pays where the generics don't have any reimbursement. We can come with a pilot model in the community that I think could save significant revenue for Medicare in an area that's really increasing. Excuse me. One, I, I was going to sneak in well, uh, one, one comment. Uh, and, and all these ideas are great, and all these academic positions, and I'm in the community, and I agree with a point that was first raised by the, your emergency room physician, correct? These are all great ideas. The IT is needed. All of these things are needed. You're working the margins. And you're dealing with all supply side, from the GME, et cetera. This country has to cross a philosophical divide. You have to look at the demand side. That's what you were talking about, and that's what I was trying to raise my, uh, my point up. We can do a lot of things as physicians. We're very successful. And the consumer wants the, that thing that we do that is successful. At some point, we're going to have to figure where the dividing line is. End of life, for instance. We see it daily in, pri in, in in private practice. ICU care, you talk about $2,300 a day for just a hospital day, imagine what ICU uh, cost is. And the doctor is put in a bad position if the family demands that everything be done. Where does the doctor say, now, where, where does the doctor say there's a limit to what we can do as physicians, okay? We have to, the country and the politicians in the country have to look at the information that we give our consumers, and that's what people are, healthcare consumers. Where, where is it rational to stop care? Where is it rational to, uh, when does it become an ineffective care? And at what point in life? I mean, we all know the statistics that have been out there for years about the 80% or 90% of the Medicare buck is spent in the last two years of life. And what I tell some of my families is, you understand what that means? We've all, had, we've all gone to school or we've, we've had cars that we've been trying to nurse. We can't afford a new car, but the water pump goes. 
and then we fix the water pump. And then, you know, then the, then the transmission goes. And we keep throwing dollars at a failing enterprise here. And at some point, we're going to have to make a philosophical choice, like they have in other countries, to set up a rational system of non-rationing, but of, of, of telling us what our limits are. I mean, the demand is unlimited. The money is not. But even if you just start a discussion, yes. ask all primary care doctors or cardiologists to have that discussion and made it um, financially viable. Uh, these discussions can be incredibly long. Yeah. Okay. Jim, you've been waiting patiently. No, no that's all right. So I had a, wanted to sneak in just a gentle couple words about vulnerable populations who are very expensive, a lot like the Medicaid dual eligibles. Um, and if we've learned anything in homeless care, which I realize is a small part of the big picture, they often show us kind of weaknesses in the system as a whole. So I think what we've learned is that for a certain population, like in Massachusetts, we basically have insurance for all of our homeless people now. But as those of you who work in Massachusetts know, that doesn't guarantee access. So we've learned we have to get out to where they are. So I suspect that's a lesson that most, most of the, um, the, if you're going to look at high risk populations, you've got to get doctors out to them. Second thing is that, and I'd leave it at this, is that we've also learned in these populations, unless we've got some way to integrate the primary and medical care with the mental health and psychiatric care and the substance abuse care, it doesn't seem to work. So I would throw those gently under the table. Instead. Okay, I, I, one of the things we did in our last physician group that was successful to end is to ask a few questions prompted by your comments to see how much agreement and unanimity, especially among people who either didn't say anything or said a comment on the other side. So one of the things I at least heard was the interest in being paid differently, and in particular, being either paid for performance or given a capitated rate. So I want to ask first, how many docs in the room think it would be a good idea if we shifted over to being paid uh, for performance? Raise your hands. Can you talk about team-based care? Is that a way to, to address that? What? what? <laughs> Look, of course, there, of course there are going to be details. But presumably, we're going to have some quality metrics, and we're going to pay you for hitting quality metrics. Leave it at that. Big assumptions. Big assumptions. That's right. OK. All right. Wait. We're just surveying. You can't write in the margin in this survey. OK? You've got to watch these New Yorkers. Wait, wait. Can, can we lift up our hand, pay for performance? Yes or no? Pay for quality. All right. Yeah. Pay for quality. How many people would be interested in shifting to more capitated payments, which we uh, heard about? Much less. OK. Why are they mutually exclusive? I didn't say they were. Just want to find out. People seem less inclined to that. Um, something about GME, sh shifting off the current GME schedule to either all-payer GME or GME for something different than the current formula. Well, that's not hospital-based. Yeah, off a hospital-based GME. Less people, less, less hospitals very interested in that. Interesting. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Um, and the last one I want to ask is something which got hinted at, but shifting uh, co-pays or some other arrangement for, uh, goes along with public education, for what people actually, the consumers actually pay for their care related to something like how important it is or how neat, uh, 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 how much it's needed or uh, co coheres with guidelines. Yeah, that, I'm confused. <laughs> Adjusting the copay as to whether it adheres with guidelines, the patient needs it more rather than just uh, so if they, discretion. Okay, yeah. right. If it's if more, right, if it adheres okay. to guidelines. That'll go for value More value-based. Value Bob, the Rand experiment. No. So, we, really, really helpful. Thank you. Uh, for me as the non-clinician here especially, this has been very invigorating and helpful to hear your ideas. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, you, thank you very much. We'll stay thank in you. touch with you and uh, uh, through a variety of ways. And I think that all of us are interested, if you have any more materials, to send <laughs> our direction. Thanks. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
church will be fine because the program is great. Let me get your car, okay? Yeah. Oh, actually, it's in my pocket. Right there in the city. I was. Governor Patrick. Okay. 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 Okay, okay. And they're not doctors, right. Right. So, uh, they're Kavita, like I'm Linda Boston. Hi. Major Pryor, you met our PCE when you were Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was young, I'm a medical officer. Yeah, nice to meet you. I'm telling you about her. She's cancer. Yeah, they're finished. So you work with Valerie and Sarah? Yeah. Give her one of my cards and tell me to call. We used to talk all the time when we were in Chicago. Yeah, okay. As a matter of fact, I...